Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're dialing in to Micah Talks today. Uh, but from wherever you're coming, uh, a very, very warm welcome to you. We've got two fabulous speakers today uh, to give us uh, an overview of aspects of medical mycology and fungal immunology. You can see we've got Petra Bacher here and we've got Clarissa Noble, and we'll be introducing them in a minute, along with my co-chair, Jay Coles. Now, just before we get started, there's just a few bits of information for you. These talks are, are organized via the medical uh, MRC-funded Center for Medical Mycology at Exeter, but they reach out to people all over the world, and you can see we take advice on our organizing committee from a wide range of people from with our own center, center, but also from our community. So in the next slide, we move that on. Um, the origin of these talks has been going for a while now. Uh, the format that we have is we have two 30 minute talks and we don't have questions between those two talks. We have the questions at the end of those and we very much in encourage you to submit your questions and please do that using the Q&A button, not through the chat if you may. Uh, there'll be a recording of this, so if you miss this or want to look at it again later, you'll be able to watch that recording uh, and that will appear and be available to, through our YouTube channel uh, tomorrow when you can access that. So in the next slide, um, just a reminder that you'll know that you'll have registered, that's if you're here, we, we have to keep uh, a registration system going so we can we can deal with this. And we, we will also give you indications of what's coming down the line. And you can see here that there are already two opportunities already planned for September 29th and October the 27th. And you can see our guests for those sessions then. And then on the next slide, I want to also mention to you, some of you will already taken advantage of our medical mycology trainee seminar series. And that's specifically for uh, students, graduate students, PhDs, but also postdocs and clinical trainees and new faculty. And it provides a, a, an informal way of it, uh, presenting your work to a really broad and global community. And those are the second Thursday of the month but we can adjust the timing as required. So do get in touch if that's also of interest to you. And then uh, if we move on, that takes us to the uh, beginning of the actual session. And I'm now going to hand over to my co-chair, Jay Coles, introduce the first of our two MicroTalk speakers. So over to you, Jay. Great, thanks, Neil. Um, it's really my pleasure and really quite excited about uh, our, both the speakers today. And our first speaker is um, Dr. Uh, Petra Bacher, who uh, is an assistant professor in immunology and immunogenetics at Keele University. Um, Dr. Bacher received her PhD in immunology at the University of Jena in 2014. And, uh, since then, it has really made tremendous insights into our understanding of, of fungal-specific uh, CD4 T-cell responses, both in terms of uh, TH17 cells and also uh, T-regulatory cells. In the context of TH17 cells, she's shown that Canada is a major uh, species that, that can drive uh, cross-reactive uh, TH17 cells. Um, um, and uh, and in, in the context of fungal allergy, um, uh, Dr. Barker has shown that, that the TCR uh, specificity of TH2 cells uh, differ from uh, T regulatory cells, and, and that may explain uh, escape of a, uh, a T reg mediated uh, suppression of, of allergic uh, responses. So, uh, uh, without further ado, I'd, I'd uh, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Barker, and we look forward to your talk. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for, for the kind introduction. And I, I really like uh, to thank the organizers for inviting me. So it's a really a great honor to, to actually um, speak here at the micro talks. Um, so 
my lab is mainly interested in uh, CD4T responses because these cells can really be regarded as central orchestrators of uh, specific immune responses. And um, this is because they have, uh, on the one hand, an antigen-specific T cell receptor, so meaning they can highly specifically recognize and react against a certain antigen. And once the T cells are activated, um, the response is not uh, uniform, but we have functional differentiation, so meaning we have the development of distinct T cell subsets that all provide uh, distinct effector functions. And in this way, they provide an immune response appropriate uh, to the uh, different kinds of antigens we encounter. And very broadly, when one can say we have we have so-called uh, conventional T cells that differentiate into effector subsets that elicit uh, different um, effector functions, but we have also regulatory T cells that can suppress unwanted immune reactions and are therefore really central uh, for tolerance mechanisms. And what is shown here then in red is, of course, when, when the T cell response is inappropriate or uncontrolled, um, it can also contribute uh, to several diseases. And so um, the, the key point I want to make here really that it's always the combination, uh, combination of the T cell specificity and the function that plays a central role for the decision between uh, protective immunity or immune pathology. And so based on this, one of our major working hypotheses is actually when we can look at the status of the thesis that are maybe specific for one defined uh, fungal microbe, this most likely reflects actually the interaction status of the host with this uh, particular fungus. And this may then differ between individuals or depending on the interaction state, so whether we had an acute or past interaction, whether we have a tolerance uh, response or whether we have an allergy or infection. Now, the technical challenge is somehow illustrated here because T cells that are specific for one uh, defined antigen are typically quite rare within a number of cells uh, with different uh, specificities. So how can we now uh, detect T cells that are specific for one uh, defined antigen? And to do so, we have actually uh, developed a system called uh, antigen reactive T cell enrichment or ART approach. Um, this is a stimulation based approach. So we can take human blood or tissue and then incubate it with basically any uh, type of antigen we are interested in. So these can be whole fungal lysates, but also proteins and peptides. And within this short uh, incubation time, the proteins are then taken up by the antigen presenting cells uh, processed and presented. And now when the T cells react uh, to the peptide MHC, they will become activated. And this means they start to upregulate uh, so-called activation markers. And we make mainly use here of two markers. Uh, the CD154 is only expressed on conventional T cells and um, the CD137, which is also 41BB, is within this short period of time actually only expressed uh, on antigen specific regulatory T cells. However, the problem, as I already mentioned, is, is shown here. So if we just uh, count like uh, 1 million PBMCs, we get uh, just few dots here of these antigen reactive cells following stimulation. So these are really rare cells. And what we therefore need to do is uh, to really uh, isolate these cells from large input cell numbers. And this then results, of course, in much bigger populations of these antigen reactive cells, which then allows a detailed uh, ex vivo functional and uh, molecular characterization that would not be uh, possible actually with these few cells here. And this is just um, yeah, to show you that via the system, we can really discriminate uh, both uh, populations here. So the CD137 positive cells are shown in red here and they express CD25, they have uh, FOXP3, so the master transcription factor of the T-Rex, uh, the majority also co-expresses Helios. And then we can further um, yeah, FUX purify these populations and perform gene expression analysis. And what you can see here is that uh, the 137 positive cells really upregulate a number of T-Rex associated markers. But for example, they completely lack effector cytokine uh, production. So really showing that the system uh, actually allows to discriminate both uh, population specific for one antigen. Uh, 
Okay, so this uh, slide, of course, does not need uh, introduction in this audience, but but I think what is clear is that we we have uh, fungal uh, microbes to which humans are chronically encountered to, like like uh, this Aspergillus, for example. And Aspergillus can also cause a variety of different uh, diseases, so people can get uh, sensitized, and it, it can also cause a severe uh, allergic uh, complications, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. It can colonize the lung and uh, also cause uh, invasive uh, infections. However, what is also interesting is that although probably all people uh, are chronically exposed to this uh, fungus, the majority of individuals does not have any problems uh, with aspergillus. And so we ask, how is this uh, healthy immune uh, response to aspergillus actually regulated on uh, the CD4 T cell level? So do we have an uh, immune control or are there active or passive uh, tolerance me mechanisms? And to start uh, actually to address this, we, we use the system that I just uh, described. So again, you can see here um, without stimulation, we have only very few of, of these background events. But if we stimulate the cells, we get really an induction of, of some hundreds or thousands of these antigen reactive cells. And now we just focus on, on the conventional T cells here. And uh, when we stimulated uh, the cells uh, actually with, with Candida albicans or CMV here as a control antigen, and we look at the phenotype of these conventional cells that react, we can see here that the majority of these cells really has a CD45 or O positive memory phenotype. So this means that these cells obviously had been in contact with their antigen uh, during an in vivo uh, immune reaction and then went into uh, the memory compartment. However, what was quite surprising uh, to us when we do the same uh, for, for Aspergillus here, and we also included a number of other uh, antigens that we call uh, aero antigens, and these are typically harmless uh, antigens like house dust mite, birch uh, pollen or grass pollen. Here the picture is different. So here we have a large proportion uh, of cells that is kind of still in a naive state. And we further characterize these cells, of course, uh, according to a number of different markers and also look at the T cell receptor repertoire. So they really look um, uh, like uh, naive uh, cells. And this somehow would suggest that although these cells, they have the right T cell receptor to recognize uh, aspergillus, obviously they have not been uh, activated uh, during an in vivo uh, immune response. And that actually a large part of this aspergillus reactive conventional T cells in healthy donors is still in a naive uh, state. So these were the, the conventional T cells. Now what about uh, the regulatory T cells? And um, what we then uh, did here was actually to screen a panel of different uh, antigens and we looked uh, for, for their capacity to elicit regulatory T cell uh, responses in, in humans. And here also, interestingly, we saw that against these aero antigens, we really find quite high numbers uh, of, of regulatory T cells um, that, that are activated. And when we then combine uh, both data sets, so the, the uh, regulatory T cells and uh, the um, effector cells, and plot this somehow as a ratio, we can see that for most of these antigens, this uh, ratio is more on, on the effector side. So although we find quite uh, strong Treg responses against some uh, of, of the, the pathogens here, we even see higher um, 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 effector responses. However, this is an, uh, clearly different for the aero antigens. Uh, so here we have like a one-to-one -one ratio, even the, the balance more shifted uh, towards uh, the regulatory T cell side. So showing that these error antigens, and again, including surprisingly uh, aspergillus, induces strong antigen-specific T-reg responses in the healthy individuals. So what we have seen so far is that in the healthy immune system, um, we obviously find this T-reg mediated uh, tolerance. And then the question was, of course, how is the situation now in, in the allergy? So are these uh, T-Rex here somehow defective? And is this the reason uh, why people uh, develop uh, an allergy towards aspergillus? 
And to start to address this, we uh, actually had a look in patients with cystic fibrosis because these patients are known to frequently um, suffer from uh, aspergillus uh, allergies. And again, when we look at as a control and the healthy donor for, for the aspergillus reactive cells, we see again this large proportion of cells being naive. So don't get confused here. So this time we, we stay in for CD45 or A, so, so the, the naive cells are these ones here. But when we look in the cystic fibrosis patients, we can see um, that, that these naive cells are almost all gone and the majority of cells now has this memory phenotype and they also upregulate this marker K67, which is a marker for recent proliferation. So indicating that uh, in, in the patients, um, the cells obviously had been recently in contact with aspergillus in an in vivo uh, reaction. And then we can uh, further um, yeah, characterize these cells and look for the cytokine production. And uh, what you can see here is that we can easily identify patients uh, that are allergic uh, to aspergillus based on this increased uh, TH2 cytokine production that is actually absent in, in healthy donors. And this also nicely correlates uh, actually with uh, aspergillus specific uh, IgE levels. So overall, um, these data show that we have really this strong increase uh, of the effector compartment against uh, aspergillus in the allergic uh, patients uh, due to this massive uh, expansion actually of the, of the TH2 type cells. However, what was quite unexpected is when we now look at the regulatory T cells, um, we did not see any differences uh, between uh, both groups. And um, to make this short, we also started to look at other parameters, so the suppressive uh, capacity of the cells, the TCR repertoire, and the functional ability. And also here, there were no differences of these aspergillus uh, reactive uh, T-rex in the allergic donors. So this um, uh, we see this different uh, actually on the total uh, T-rex level, but the aspergillus reactive cells, they seem to be uh, quite normal. However, when we then look again at this ratio, we can see that somehow this protective one-to-one uh, -one ratio that we have seen uh, in, in, in the healthy individuals is really shifted uh, also towards uh, the effector side here. So obviously um, our data suggests that uh, actually the T-Rex seem to be uh, rather normal in the allergic individuals, but still we get uh, this strong TH2 uh, response. And so the, the key question is of course, how can now uh, these TH2 cells escape uh, the T-Rex control? And the question to this, uh, the answer to this came when we had a closer look actually at, at the protein specificity. And I will first show you some data that we uh, generated with birch pollen specific cells, and then we can have a look at, at aspergillus, whether we find something uh, similar here. So what is known for, for allergenic proteins since a long time is that they are highly water soluble uh, antigens typically. And so if you put the birch pollen into water and it comes in contact with the lung epithelium, um, these uh, allergens, they rapidly leave this inhaled uh, particles. And we thought that maybe this physical separation of the allergens from the rest of the inhaled uh, particles might be really important uh, for the outcome uh, of the TSA reaction. And so we generated both types of lysates here, a soluble fraction and the particle fraction. So this just shows uh, actually the protein bands. And now when we stimulate with these uh, two different uh, lysates, we can see here that all healthy individuals, uh, but also all uh, allergic individuals, they have quite robust uh, T-reg responses against this particle fraction, but not against the soluble lysate. And vice versa, when we look at the TH2 response, we can see here that this is mainly directed against the soluble proteins, also indicating that this fraction contains uh, the major uh, allergenic uh, proteins. So what about uh, aspergillus? And um, to, to start to address this, we actually sorted um, the aspergillus reactive TH2 cells here. So this can be done via staining for these markers here, TH2, and then we can expand these cells and re-challenge them with uh, different antigens. 
And this we did here for several um, um, allergic um, um, cystic fibrosis patients. And then we re-challenged them with a panel of different uh, aspergillus proteins. And we could define proteins that did not generate uh, a TH2 response here because the TH2 cells did not uh, react to them. And we could also define a panel of different uh, proteins that we named TH2 targets because um, they, they elicit uh, this uh, reaction of uh, the aspergillus uh, reactive TH2 cells. And interestingly, these um, TH2 targets, um, many of them are actually identified in the secretome um, of the fungus, so suggesting that, again, we might have here also physical separation of, of these proteins, um, maybe from the rest of the fungus. And now when we look again at the Treg response, we pulled in all uh, these non-target proteins and the TH2 target proteins. We can see here again that, that the Treg response is mainly directed uh, against the non-TH2 targets in both uh, the non-allergic and the allergic uh, CF patients. Again, showing that obviously the Treg and the TH2 cells, they uh, target uh, completely uh, different uh, proteins here. So to make a, a summary to, to this first part, um, what our data suggests is that airborne antigens, and uh, again, including uh, aspergillus here, they are obviously quite potent inducer of regulatory T cell responses in, in uh, humans. But these T-Rex, they seem to be mainly uh, directed against a particle associated fraction. And then the T-Rex obviously can uh, efficiently control the activation of uh, the naive T cells. And this is why we see that the large part of the cells is still in a naive state. However, um, the, the uh, allergens they somehow escape uh, this T-Rex induction process because uh, they are also actively secreted or they leave uh, maybe this inhaled uh, particle. And we, our data suggests that maybe these antigens are largely ignored by the healthy immune system because here we do not see uh, any uh, reaction. However, exactly these proteins can become uh, targets of uh, TH2 uh, responses in the allergic uh, donors. And overall, our data suggests that, that this TH2 response uh, can be only directed against uh, those proteins that are uh, actually not protected uh, by a specific regulatory T cell uh, response, also highlighting somehow uh, the, the relevance of the TREG uh, specificity uh, to, to prevent uh, the allergy uh, generation. So what we have seen is that, that the TH2 cells uh, escape uh, the TREG control uh, by targeting uh, different uh, proteins, actually. And so for, for the next part uh, of my talk, I'd, I'd like to focus on another uh, T cell subset uh, that has for a long time been actually associated with this fungal antigens and the, the TH17 cells. And what we then did here was uh, really to, to look in, in the broad panel of uh, different uh, fungal uh, species, uh, whether they have uh, generated uh, TH17 uh, responses in humans. And so the surprising result was here really that only against one uh, fungus, Candida albicans, we really find this dominant uh, TH7 uh, T uh, response. And against all these other uh, fungi, TH17 cells are rather low. So really suggesting that uh, Candida is actually the major driver of fungus-specific uh, TH17 cells in humans. And what is also interesting here is that uh, we find these cells actually in all uh, individuals that we have uh, looked for so far. And um, this also suggests that probably everybody is uh, yeah, constantly or at least one time in contact uh, with Candida albicans. And that this TH17 cells are really also required for homeostatic uh, interaction with this fungus. However, when we, when we look again at the aspergillus response here quite carefully, we can see here um, that the response is not uh, completely zero. So there are around 5% uh, of these cells that also produce uh, TH17 uh, cytokines. And so we got interested in that and also uh, wanted to further uh, characterize actually uh, these aspergillus reactive cells. And so what we did here then was to, to isolate again the CD154 positive cells. We expanded them and then re-challenged them with different antigens. 
And what you can see here is that they nicely re-react to Aspergillus as we, as we have expected. But there was surprisingly this small population of, of cells that were initially uh, stimulated with Aspergillus that also cross-recognized uh, Candida albicans antigens. So simply because uh, these uh, fungi have homologous uh, proteins. However, when we now look at the cytokine production, um, we can see here that in response to the total uh, aspergillus lysate, we see only low IL-17, IL-22, as we have uh, seen before in the ex vivo data. However, these few cross-reactive cells here, they really produce higher amounts uh, of IL-17, IL-22. And this somehow uh, suggests that within the Aspergillus immune response, we have a small fraction of cells that is cross-reactive uh, to Candida albicans. And obviously, this cross-reactivity induces the Th17 response uh, into the Aspergillus immune response. So what we think what's happening is that we have Candida albicans, so uh, and commensal mainly in the gastrointestinal tract, and for, for some reason, a really potent inducer of Th17 uh, cells, while all other fungi that we have looked for so far do not generate this type of response on their own. But just by chance, some of these Th17 cells obviously cross recognize proteins from Aspergillus simply because they are homologous proteins. And via this T cell cross reactivity, we then get an induction of uh, Th17 cells into the uh, Aspergillus immune response. And then the next question of, of course, uh, where does this now uh, play a role? And um, since uh, increased uh, TH17 uh, responses are also associated with different uh, inflammatory airway diseases, we also started to have a look at the Aspergillus uh, response in these different uh, pulmonary diseases. And then we then look um, again for the IL-17 production here in comparison to healthy donors, we see this clearly increase uh, aspergillus reactive IL-17 in patients uh, with asthma, COPD, or especially uh, cystic fibrosis. So indicating that there's really a selective expansion of uh, these uh, cross-reactive uh, TH17 cells in uh, the pulmonary diseases. But do they also, contribute then to the pathology and um, to start to address this, we, we actually had again a closer look in our cystic fibrosis cohort. So as, as already mentioned, they are frequently sensitized uh, to aspergillus and approximately 10% of them uh, develop also an uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. And now when we look again into our uh, sensitized patients here, defined uh, by an increased uh, Aspergillus-specific uh, TH2 and also an IgE response, and again look for the, for the cytokine production of the Aspergillus-reactive cells, we can see here that we find this increased IL-17 uh, response only in patients um, that have an acute ABPA at the time point of our measurement. And then the, the levels rapidly drop when patients get treated uh, with antifungals and corticosteroids. And we also don't see it in patients that receive a prophylactic treatment or in patients that had the history of ABPA, but uh, not at the time point of our measurement. And interestingly, when we look at the, at the TH2 response here, we did not see any uh, differences between these groups, so really suggesting that maybe this selective increase of the IL-17 response might contribute uh, to, to the pathology in the acute ABPA. And we also did not find uh, actually differences in, in other cytokine producing cells. Now, finally, um, are these cells also cross-reactive in these conditions? And uh, to, to show this, we again expanded uh, the aspergillus reactive cells from the cystic fibrosis patients, uh, so the IL-17 producers and also the TH2 cells. And as you can see here, the IL-17 producers, they really show 100% cross-reactivity, so they can equally uh, be activated uh, with, with both uh, fungi. While the TH2 cells, interestingly, they only react uh, to aspergillus, which again shows also that the TH2 response is obviously directed against completely uh, different uh, proteins um, that are obviously uh, not uh, present in, in Candida albicans. <laughs> 
And although all these data suggest um, that these cross-reactive TH17 cells expand in the pulmonary inflammation and their strong association with, with the acute ABPA suggests that they may actively contribute to the manifestation or exacerbation of the ABPA. Now, to put this also into the model, um, what our data suggests is that in, in the airway diseases, we might have an increased interaction uh, with aspergillus, and this leads uh, to the expansion of such a cross-reactive uh, TH17 response. And we have seen that especially when this uh, comes together with the TH2 response, um, this seems to uh, drive uh, pathology in, in these patients. Okay, so to put this also into the scheme, so we have seen there's really this expansion of the cross-reactive TH17 cells in asthma, COPD, and also cystic fibrosis. And as mentioned, um, these cells might play especially a role uh, during the, the acute ABPA. And so the last uh, question is then, of course, uh, that I want to address today, what is now in, in invasive infection? And how uh, do we see similarities or difference in here compared to, to the hypersensitivity reactions? And these invasive fungal infections, they're of course difficult uh, to diagnose. So the, the gold standard is still like an histological proof of the infection from a uh, tissue biopsy. And these biopsies are, are of course sometimes difficult uh, to, to obtain because these are critical um, ill patients. And what we did here then was to look in a group of, of hematologic patients that are at risk for invasive uh, mycosis, and we simply um, quantified the aspergillus and also uh, mucor specific TSA response here. And in this case, we did this without the enrichment. So you can see here in the healthy donors, uh, there are few cells that actually react. But what was really um, yeah, striking if, is when we look in the invasive aspergillosis, so this is improved uh, aspergillosis, we first of all see that these patients are really uh, strongly immunocompromised because there are just 2% of, of total CD4 T cells left. But within this small fraction of T-cells, we really see this huge expansion of the aspergillus uh, reactive cells. And we also see this in, in other invasive uh, fungal infections, like uh, these mucor infections, that we really get this strong expansion of the fungus reactive cells. Also suggesting that uh, the, the uh, measurement of fungus reactive T-cells might even be a diagnostic tool for these invasive fungal infections. So, and when we plot then the data together and just look at the frequencies, um, you can uh, see here um, that in really in this uh, invasive fungal infection, we get this uh, very strong expansion of, of the fungus reactive cells, so much more than what we have seen in the cystic fibrosis patients, although these frequencies were already uh, elevated uh, compared to the healthy donors. However, what, what is interesting when we then look at the cytokine production, so despite this uh, strong increase in the reactivity, these cells uh, only produce low amounts of, of interferon gamma 17 and also um, L10, which uh, really questions uh, their role as, as a uh, yeah, protective uh, for being protective during the invasive uh, fungal infections. And this might maybe also explain why uh, the people cannot uh, yeah, control um, the, the infections despite this strong increase uh, of the fungus reactive T cells. So what we see in, in the invasive fungal infections that we have really is a strong expansion of the antifungal T cells, but they have only pure, poor uh, um, uh, effect of functions. And there are, of course, a lot of uh, open questions remaining. For example, we do not know yet what is the role of the regulatory T cells here that might even further counteract uh, a protective role of, of the T cells in, in this uh, invasive infections. Yes, and with this, uh, I'm, I'm at the end. So I really like to thank a lot of uh, people that contributed to the study. So this is my group in Kiel and, and Gabriela and Anne Christine, uh, two PhD students, provided uh, some of the data here. So long-term collaboration with uh, Alexander Sheffold, with uh, whom together we, we developed some of, of uh, the data and the concepts here. 
And I really like to highlight an outstanding collaboration with uh, Axel Brackhage, Olaf Kniemeyer, Bernhard Huber, and Sascha Funke. So they are really absolutely essential for, for everything we are doing with uh, fungal uh, microbes. Uh, so they are really the fungal specialists, and we, we are coming more from, from the T cell side here. And then we have a great uh, number of clinical collaborations. So the CF uh, study was done together with Carsten Schwarz and patients Eschenhagen. Um, the asthma COPD study uh, together with uh, Life Sander and uh, the hematologic uh, patients in a great collaboration with Oliver Corneli and uh, Philip Köhler in Cologne. And I will stop here and I will be happy to take questions at the end of the session. Thank you, uh, Petra. That was great. Um, it, now I'll turn over to uh, my co chair, Dr. Neil Gao introduce uh, uh, our next speaker. Thank you, Petra, and thank you, Jay. So uh, obviously a fantastic pleasure to be able to welcome Clarissa Nobile um, to give a, a micro talk with us. Um, a little bit of background about Clarissa, uh, trained in Columbia University, um, doing her MA in film and then PhD with Aaron Mitchell, and then moved to Sandy Johnson's lab at UCSF and then took up her faculty position where she is now. She has uh, got the Manger Family Endowed Chair in Biological Sciences, and she's an Associate Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California at Merced, one of the new universities in California. She's a co-founder and Chief, Chief Scientific Officer of a, a Bay Area startup company called Bios, Biosensis, oh, I put that right. Uh, and that is a company which is devoted to establishing uh, biofilm specific diagnostics and therapeutics and, and closest to all our work in, in uh, biofilms in the past. And the objective is to generate new uh, aids to diagnose and treat very difficult hospital infections. And uh, her work in general is being inspired by understanding molecular mechanisms of, around microbial communities. And most of that, as we know, has done has been focused on candida, uh, a number of species, predominantly candida albicans. She's also recently been working on candida auris, but she's also studying interspecies interactions between fungi and bacteria. And she's, as we will know, been published extensively in that area and have been uh, received numerous awards for her, her work as a, an LAQ researcher in this field. And today she's going to turn her attention to an area which will be of great interest to many of us. And the title that you've given us, uh, Carissa, is Host Mucins as Natural Inhibitors of Candida Albicans Biofilm. So we're really looking forward to hearing about that story. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Neil. Let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. Are you seeing that now? Um, We're not in. Ah, oh, there it there is. It's go. Just gone into okay. presenter mode. Thank you. I guess there's a little lag. Okay. And I'm going to get a little laser pointer too, in case I might want that. All right. So yeah, thanks so much. That was a really kind introduction, Neil. <laughs> um, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to those of you on California time like me. Um, thank you all for coming. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here for this month's um, Myco Talks. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers um, as well as the chairs. So um, Neil Gao and Jay Coles for the invitation to be here today. And so today I'm gonna to talk about some of our new um, collaborative work on um, host mucins as natural inhibitors of candida albicans biofilms. And so I'm pretty excited about this work. It's, it's very new, it was just, um, just, some of it was just recently published. All right. Okay, so uh, I just, before I get started, um, Neil did mention it, but I, I just wanna disclose some of my potential conflicts of interest. So I am a co-founder and currently the CEO of Biosynesis. Um, and that's a biotech company whose mission is to develop 
biofilm specific diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, I'm also a consultant for another company, so that's Blue Earth Labs, which is a water um, disinfecting and cleaning company. Okay, so before I get started, I also wanted to highlight a few of the major uh, research areas in my lab since um, we are hiring, and these include you know, studying the regulators, target genes, and network architecture of um, biofilms. Um, we also like are starting to study the chromatin landscape changes that occur during, bi during biofilm formation. Um, we also develop and optimize tools to um, study biofilms. And we're also interested in translating our findings to develop biofilm biomarkers, diagnostics, um, as well as compounds for inhibiting and disrupting biofilms, as Neil had um, mentioned. And my lab also studies interspecies interactions that occur during biofilm formation and how um, polymicrobial biofilms are regulated. And then finally, um, we're also interested in understanding the host pathogen interactions that occur during fungal and infections. Um, and my talk today is, is going to focus on this latter area um, in terms of how candida albicans interacts with host mucins. And so um, the findings I'll talk about were recently published and are largely the result of a, a very um, big transdisciplinary uh, collaboration between Katarina Ribeck, who is a um, biophysicist at MIT, and Rachel Heavy, who is a glycochemist at the University of Basel. And then this work was led by a few amazing graduate students and postdocs, and I'll mention them specifically um, throughout the talk. Okay, so just very briefly, what is a biofilm? Um, a biofilm is the most predominant natural growth state of almost all microorganisms in any moist or aquatic environment. And it's composed of this interactive community of microbes, and it can be made up of a single species or of um, multiple species. Um, cells in a biofilm are embedded in a protective matrix of extracellular substances that typically the cells in the biofilms um, produce themselves. And the ability to form, to form biofilms is a virulence factor, as we all know. Um, and it's a virulence factor for many microbes with pathogenic potential. And there are many distinct properties that are associated with um, biofilms, such as extensive drug resistance, um, adherence, and the ability to evade the immune system. And the mechanisms behind these distinct properties, um, especially when it comes to fungal biofilms, are um, poorly understood. And biofilms really are everywhere. And here are just a few examples of where we um, encounter them in every day. So we're all probably very well aware of biofilms that form in our bathrooms, right, on our shower heads and inside our toilets. And to get rid of them, you know, we use bleach cleaners and we scrub, which is kind of annoying, but it's not too bad. Um, but when biofilms form inside our bodies, you know, they're, they cause major problems because obviously we can't use bleach and we can't scrub them away. Um, and they are inherently resistant to all sorts of antimicrobial agents um, and drugs. And biofilms are a particularly serious problem uh, medically because they can form on all kinds of um, implanted medical devices, such as central venous catheters um, and heart valves. Also, um, host mucosal epithelial surfaces are um, really great biotic substrates for biofilms to grow on. And these substrates provide you know, really nice areas for the biofilm cells to grow, um, but they also act as a portal of entry for the biofilm infecting cells to then enter the bloodstream um, of the host. And we know that the biofilm um, itself becomes this growing reservoir of infection of cells that then can lead to an infection. Um, and in fact, the NIH is currently estimating that over 80% of microbial infections actually um, originate for, from a biofilm, which is pretty striking. Now, um, the top microbial players in causing biofilm infections in the clinic include um, staphylococci, streptococci, and enterococci. And those are all bacterial pathogens, um, as well as the fungal pathogens in the candida clade, and then particularly um, candida albicans. And these biofilm infections have um, strikingly high mortality rates, um, approaching about 50%. And here's just um, really quick, the candida albicans biofilm life cycle. So we all know candida albicans is this multimorphic fungal pathogen um, whose biofilm um, begins with the attachment of these um, pioneering yeast form cells to a surface. 
This is followed by cell proliferation and aggregation, yielding a basal layer of um, anchoring yeast microcolonies. Um, this is then followed by extensive hyphal growth, um, concordant with the production of um, that extracellular matrix material that um, encases all of the cells. And then finally, um, biofilm formation culminates in the dispersion of those um, pioneering yeast form cells to then um, go on and colonize new surfaces, including um, mucosal epithelial surfaces. Um, they can also um, see it a bloodstream infection as well. All right. And so briefly to introduce um, mucus a little bit, since um, um, much of the talk will focus on this. Um, mucus basically is a very protective um, substance for the host. And it's a viscoelastic hydrogel that's comprised of 95% water, 3% mucin glycoproteins or mucins, um, and 2% small molecules, including um, immunoglobulin A or IgA, um, lipids, and also um, antimicrobial peptides. So mucus provides um, lubrication and hydration to all um, non keratinized, so not, not anything that's not skin, basically, epithelial surfaces, um, and is really a critical host innate um, immune defense factor that protects the host um, from infection. And this protection is largely attributed um, to large secreted or membrane bound, so these are membrane bound or secreted glycoproteins um, called mucins. And so here is a mucin mon monomer shown in the um, bottom of the slide. And this is just sort of a schematic of it, but you can see it consists of, um, oops, yeah. Sorry, I lost my laser pointer. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, it consists of um, this protein core domain here, which are these little green um, parts shown here. And, or, or no, those are also referred to as PTS domains. And then it also has these many, um, O-glycans that ex, uh, basically extrude from the PTS domains. Um, they, they kind of look like popsicles here. All right, so now we know that invasive um, infections typically occur when microbes breach the mucosal barrier. Um, and we know that host genes encoding mucins have been found to be upregulated um, during mucosal infections. So um, given that candida albicans is a biofilm forming opportunistic fungal pathogen, that resides within the human mucosa, um, we wondered whether mucins regulate candida albicans virulence. So um, to determine whether mucins regulate vir virulence, um, we first purified um, muc 5AC, which is a, a gastric mucin, um, muc 2, an intestinal mucin, and, and muc 5B, a salivary mucin. Um, so we purified those from mucus, um, from these different host uh, mucosal sources. And this work was led by um, Nicole Cavanaugh, um, a graduate student. So we then added the purified mucins to candida albicans cells grown under um, filamentation inducing conditions and observed um, cell morphology changes. And so the images that I'm showing you here are um, basically these are phase contrast microscopy images taken after 90 minutes of growth in the presence um, and absence of the purified mucins. And these are under filamentation inducing conditions in our PMI media. And so just to kind of uh, highlight a few of the different morphologies here. So that we know of, you know, these are the yeast, normal yeast cells. These are hyphae. Here are opaque cells. And these are what the mucin exposed candida albicans cells look like. And so you can clearly see that in the presence of the different mucins, um, that the mucins are inhibiting filamentation. And they seem to be inducing this sort of unique morphological state that kind of resembles the, the opaque cells here. Um, but it's actually distinct because mucin exposed cells um, do not upregulate any of the white opaque transcription factor genes we checked. Um, and they're not uh, mating competent like opaque cells. So they just sort of resemble them, but they're different. Um, we also found that mucins um, do not affect candida albicans cell growth um, or, or viability. So next, we performed um, an adherence assay to assess whether mucins affect the um, initial adherence um, stage of biofilm formation. And these experiments were, uh, these are performed again in RPMI media. And um, 
fluorescent candida albicans cells were allowed to adhere to a polystyrene surface. The surface was then washed, um, and then the cells were um, quantified. And the images that I'm showing you here, um, these were from an experiment um, using purified MUC5AC, which is the gastric mucin, um, but the results were similar um, using the other purified mucins as well. And what you can clearly see is that um, adherence was reduced and it's sort of, it's reduced as early as 30 minutes in this assay and that reduction in adherence um, becomes more pronounced over time. Okay, so, you know, given that mucins inhibit fermentation and reduce adherence, um, we next asked uh, whether mucins affect biofilm formation in candida albicans. And so for these assays, we perform standard um, biofilm assays on the bottoms of polystyrene plates. Again, this is in our PMI media um, in the presence and absence of purified mucins. And shown here are um, confocal scanning laser microscopy. So here we have top and side views um, where you can clearly see you know, a nice thick biofilm forming here over the course, course of 48 hours. Um, this is in the absence of mucins. But then in the presence of mucins, biofilm development is um, severely inhibited. You get these sort of thin um, films, um, and they're also pretty weak biofilms. They're very delicate and easily disruptible. Okay, so we next decided to perform some genome-wide um, expression profiling um, experiments. So this is by RNA-seq on the candidate cells grown in the presence and um, uh, absence of, of the three purified mucins. <clears throat> and this work was led by graduate student Julie Takaki um, in collaboration with postdoctoral scholar um, Mega Gulati. And so what we found was that each purified mucin type um, elicited a specific gene expression profile with um, 262 downregulated and 343 upregulated genes shared among the three uh, transcriptional profiles of the three different mucins. And um, of the shared differentially expressed genes, um, mucins overall um, downregulate genes involved in um, biofilm formation, um, filmentation, and also proteolytic degradation, and also upregulate genes um, involved in um, things like amino acid biosynthesis, um, metabolism, and the maintenance of the planktonic um, and yeast form. So, just to summarize what I've told you so far, um, I've shown you that mucins suppress filmentation, um, adherence, and biofilm formation, and um, downregulate genes involved in these pathways, um, as well as the selection of genes involved in proteolytic degradation. So overall, it appears to suppress um, that it appears that mucins um, suppress the pathogenic potential of candida albicans. And so we next wondered, you know, what specific components of mucins are actually responsible for interacting with candida albicans and suppressing its virulence. And so we hypothesized that um, mucin O-glycans are the active components of mucins that um, attenuate candida albicans pathogenicity. And we hypothesized this because um, there have been previous studies that have shown that mucin glycans um, can serve as nutrients, um, binding sites, as well as signaling molecules for um, a handful of certain bacterial pathogens like Helicobacter pylori. <clears throat> so we thought, you know, maybe the same sort of thing was happening in um, candida albicans. Okay, so um, now mucin O-glycan structures are not commercially available. Um, and because of their readily overlapping physical and chemical properties um, are not readily isolated as pure compounds from natural sources um, using current technologies that we have available. So to solve these issues and to help us address our hypothesis that mucin O-glycons are active components of mucins that attenuate um, candida albicans pathogenicity, um, we collaborated with glycochemist Rachel Heavy, who um, is a research associate at the University of Basel. And so Rachel is just about the only person in the world, I think, with the experience to do this. And um, she successfully developed a novel synthetic approach to streamline the synthesis of a library of mucinoglycans in um, sufficient quantity, so actually greater than 20 milligrams, which is quite significant. And I'm not gonna like attempt to explain her 
chemical process here since it's way over my head. Um, but you can read all about it in her recently published paper describing the protocol here. So that's in this Chemistry Open um, journal. It's, it's described all the chemistry you'll ever want to know about this process is described in detail here. Um, but briefly, you know, mucin O glycans were isolated from muc 5 ac again, the gastric mucin. And this was done by non-reductive alkaline beta elimination, which um, preserved the structural heterogeneity of the glycan chains, and then yielded a library of glycans um, that were released from the muc 5 ac mucin. Um, she then analyzed the released uh, glycans using um, nanospray ionization, multidimensional mass spectrometry um, to basically characterize their structural um, topology features. And she, at the end, came up with a strategy to synthesize a library of the O-glycans that basically mimic their structures and abundances that are found in the original isolated mucins. So this is a really impressive process. And so for MUC5AC, for example, she identified um, over 80 glycan structures that she then um, synthesized um, into a library, which we used. And so here are the O-glycan structures from um, MUC5AC, the gastric mucin, that Rachel used um, to synthesize um, a library of mucin glycans. And you can see that MUC5AC um, was dominated by sort of core one and core two type of O-glycan structures. Um, you know, most of, I think the, the, the general abundances are really core one and core two, but all of the different O-glycans are included in her library. And in, again, the proper abundances. <clears throat> so we next decided to perform, again, genome-wide expression profiling by RNA-seq using Rachel's uh, synthesized mucin oglycan library. And here we found that 308 genes were downregulated and 233 genes were upregulated, which um, was actually quite similar to the RNA-seq performed under the purified um, intact mucins that I showed you earlier. And um, like the intact mucins, um, mucin O glycans downregulated genes involved in biofilm formation, um, filamentation, and proteolytic degradation. And up uh, again, upregulated genes involved in amino acid biosynthesis, metabolism, and then the maintenance of the yeast, form yeast and planktonic forms. Um, and this is compared to the absence of the mucin O glycans. So um, this was super exciting um, since the expression profile for O-glycans was extremely similar um, to that of intact mucins, um, suggesting that the mucin O-glycans are really the components of mucins that are exerting their biological effects on, um, or, or functional effects on Canada albicans virulence. And so we next performed an adherence assay using the um, synthesized mucin O-glycans. Um, these experiments were again um, performed in RPMI medium um, and fluorescent candida albicans candid cells were allowed to adhere to a polystyrene surface um, for 90 minutes. The surface was washed and then the cells were um, quantified. And so um, the images that I'm showing you here were from an experiment um, using the synthesized um, muc 5 ac oglycans. And so again, you know, similar to the intact mucins, you see that the mucin um, oglycans affect uh, clearly reduce adherence, um, while actually, and here's the quantification of, of, um, of this over here, um, the different, this is quantification of the adherence uh, to the polystyrene plates. You can see that um, the, the mucin O glycan significantly decreased adherence, whereas um, equivalent amounts of monosaccharides actually had no effects on the adherence, similar to just the medium alone. So we next asked whether our synthesized mucinoglycans um, affect biofilm formation. And again, we performed standard biofilm assays on the bottoms of polystyrene plates in our PMI medium in the presence and absence of the synthesized mucinoglycans. Uh, and shown here, um, sorry, these are not confocal images. These are just a quick um, check by phase contrast uh, microscopy images, um, looking down at the biofilm, um, where you can clearly see a nice kind of thick biofilm. Um, th this, these biofilms are formed over the course of 24 hours. Um, here is in the absence of mucin, a nice thick biofilm. Um, and in the presence of the mucin O glycan uh, library um, provided by Rachel, um, you can see that um, biofilm development was severely inhibited. Um, you can also see quite thin and um, yeasty biofilms when we um, um, when we actually quantified the biofilms. 
And here, over here is measuring um, on the right, the, uh, we quantified the percentage of cells free floating in the medium. So the planktonic cells. Um, and you can clearly see that candida albicans cells are maintained in the planktonic form um, in the presence of the mucid oglycans, right? So they're largely all planktonic, while equivalent amounts of the monosaccharides um, ma and maintain cells in the biofilm state, just like the medium alone. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, okay, so yeah, so I just wanted to also mention that Rachel has um, synthesized mucinoglycan libraries representing different host mucins. So it wasn't just the gastric mucin, but um, also um, she synthesized them for the intestinal mucins and the sal salivary mucins as well. Um, and we've shown that all mucin-derived oglycans are sufficient to suppress um, filmentation in candida albicans, and that's what you're, what's being shown here. You can see, again, in the media alone, without any of the oglycans, um, you have a nice um, long hyphae, and in the presence of each of the different oglycans libraries, um, you have significant inhibition of uh, filmentation. Okay, so um, in summary, I showed you that um, mucinoglycans are potent inhibitors of filmentation, um, adherence, and biofilm formation in candida albicans, and that they do this without affecting cell growth or viability. Um, we're excited that mucinoglycans can now be synthesized. Um, and you know, given this information, it seems likely that mucin oglycans could be leveraged for therapeutic um, applications. Um, for example, you know, future therapeutics may include like glycan-based or glycan mimetic compounds that could be used in combination, um, like in combination with existing antifungal drugs, or could possibly replace them under certain circumstances. Um, and lastly. I want to emphasize that, you know, the complex lichen structures in mucus are critical um, to maintaining a healthy mucosal environment and that, you know, degradation or modification of mucin glycans could, you know, trigger candida albicans to transition um, from a harmless commensal um, to a pathogen and vice versa, right? So I kind of like envision the biofilm state as, um, as, as a virulence, the you know, biofilm formation is this virulence factor uh, on mucosal surfaces, but having the mucus there, and specifically the mucins, and specifically the oglycan structures of the mucins, um, is what kind of keeps candida albicans in check, right? So it doesn't let it overgrow, forming a very thick biofilm. It actually keeps it really thin on the mucosal surface. Um, and so before I end, I just wanted to quickly mention some um, exciting and unpublished work from graduate student Ashley Valle Revelo, who is working on discovering the transcriptional network um, controlling the interaction of candida albicans with host mucin. So um, Ashley's work may actually identify uh, potential candida albicans receptors for sensing mucins. Um, and, and, it's, and she's already identified um, many regulators, transcription factors that are required for um, the ability for Canada to sense, to sense um, mucins. So stay tuned. Um, and if, of course, if you're looking for speakers in the future, she's, she's an excellent choice. She's now postdoc um, in my lab and is on, on the job market. <laughs> okay, so as I mentioned um, at the beginning of my talk, this work was the result of a collaboration between a highly transdisciplinary team of scientists um, that was really led by these amazing female scientists. Um, and I mentioned them uh, throughout the talk, but Katarina Ribeck is a biophysicist at MIT whose lab um, focuses on studying the viscoelastic properties of mucus. Um, Rachel Heavy is a glycochemist at the University of Basel. She's a research associate whose work um, focuses on, on the study of glycopolymers um, for, for therapeutic potential. Um, Nicole Cabanow, um, Julie Tagaki, and Ashley Vallarevelo were all fantastic graduate students, and Mega Gulati was a fantastic um, postdoctoral scholar. And then lastly, I'd just um, like to acknowledge um, my, my, all my lab members um, who are really a fantastic bunch of scientists, um, as well as all of our collaborators uh, that I didn't get to mention, and of course, um, all of our funding sources 
And um, thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take um, any questions. Clarissa, that was a fabulous talk and it was beautifully presented and uh, very exciting, uh, can both data and implications for the future. So I'm sure there'll be, I know that there are already plenty of questions coming in. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of alternate our questions um, so that each, each of the speakers can have a moment uh, between them just to pose themselves for the next one. So I'll pass on to my co-chair Jay to ask the first question. Great. Um, yeah, so this is a question from Paul, Dr. Paul Fidel uh, for Petra about, uh, did you look at IL-17 responses to other candidate species and um, or are they really specific for abacans? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So we, we still have it on, on the to-do list, uh, but uh, definitely we, we should do that. I mean, there are data out uh, from, from Salome, uh, for example, where she identified these ALS3 peptides to also induce TH17 responses. And this is highly conserved, for example, with other candida species. So it might be that, that they also drive this kind of response, but, but we should uh, definitely look more into that. I mean, it relates to the question, what makes Candida unique, right? Kind of in inducing this, this type of uh, th 70 response. And I think what, what might be really critical factors is, is the ability to adhere to the epithelium uh, that Candida abicans can do, but obviously also uh, other, other Candidas may do that. And that uh, Candida lysine might really be involved in, in then damaging uh, the cells and release TH17 inducing uh, cytokines. Um, but um, we, we should look into that more deeply. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll take the chair's prerogative and ask a question about the, your AVPA cohort. So um, obviously a lot of cystic fibrosis patients get colonized with aspergillus, but don't develop AVPA, right? So um, have you had an opportunity to look at their T cells and whether um, uh, yeah, we they have T regs, but just fail to develop TH2 or, or what, what's going on there? Definitely, that's interesting because we really think that the, the in the cystic fibrosis has a completely different interaction with aspergillus than we have in, in the healthy individuals. And we see this also on the T cell level. So, I mean, the TH2 is the most obvious, right? That you, you get the allergic uh, reaction, but we also see different other patterns that you get like a strong TH1 response, others develop more like uh, selectively TH17 responses. And we really, uh, yeah, try to dissect this a little bit uh, in the, in the different patient uh, cohorts. And what is interesting is that these patterns that we find there seem to be really stable. So we have patients that we monitored now for over five years, and once you have such a strong TH1 response, you always uh, stay with that, while the ones that have developed the TH2 response uh, stay with the allergic reaction. Um, but overall, it shows that really in, in the cystic fibrosis, the interaction with aspergillus seems to be completely different than what we have in the healthy donors. Thanks. I'll turn it over to Dr. Gao. So, Clarissa, um, I've got a couple of questions from Sweta Singh. And first of all, can you give us any more information about the differences in the inhibition amongst the, the gastric salivary and intestinal mucins? And secondly, is it possible that the mucins might inhibit possible lipases? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I didn't really talk about the differences. I kind of focused on um, the similarities between the different mucins, but actually, um, if you're, you can find all of the data. So that's in that Tagaki et al. 2022 paper was published in Nature Chemical Biology. All of the um, expression profiling data is there. So you can search for fossil lipases. I don't recall if those were um, present. And yeah, and there's definitely di differences between the gastric, um, the intestinal and the salivary mucins. Um, so if you're specifically interested in that, I, I really encourage you to, to, to search through that data because we, you know, we haven't gone through it all in, in such detail, um, really just focused on the similarities. <clears throat> but that would be really um, kind of neat to, to focus on what's different about them. And, and to some extent, you know, some of the different mucins, I think the gastric mucin, um, I think it was muc 5AC and then muc 2, which were kind of the best at inhibiting filamentation. Um, and then muc 5V was was still good, but not not quite as good. So there's definitely some interesting um, differences between between those three, at least that we looked at. And, and there's, of course, many other um, mucosal linings that can be looked at in the future. But yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> and the inhibition of phospholipases? 
Yeah, so you'd have to look. I don't recall that specifically in, in the data, but it's it's all there. So search. Okay. So Neil, can I ask a follow up question? So, so in the respiratory tract, you know, the um, muc five AC is coming from the epithelium, and then the muc five B is coming from the submucosal glands, and then they kind of intertwine and form like these rope strand structures. So, have have you looked at you know maybe the two together and try to model that? Um, I don't know. If no. That even I don't know. It may not be relevant for the GI tract. I, I don't know how um, how these. Yeah, it, I think the MUC five B is really the predominant one in the GI tract, but um, but I think it definitely would be interesting to to kind of yeah put them in together. We haven't done that, so. So uh, I'm going to spend my uh, chair's prerogative card now as well, since Jay's led the way. Um, I was wondering, since you have access to both the oglycans from the mucins and the mucins themselves whether you'd performed any sort of cell surface binding assays by labeling those. And there are some simple questions which you probably are very obvious ones, such as, is there more uh, morphology specific binding and does that affect the effect on hyphae, but no effect on other cells? And yeah, so we haven't, related, yeah. And re related to that, I mean, it, it, if, if there's binding, of course it keeps the, the prospect of a receptor open but it's also possible, I suppose, that some of it could be delivered through the wall, perhaps even through uh, a vesicle, for example, and the, the effect could be cytoplasmic. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are all possibilities. And yeah, I don't know. We don't know specifically if there's a receptor. That's just one of the ideas we have because other bacterial pathogens, um, some of them do have receptors. So we were just sort of kind of yeah. hypothesizing based on, on what's previously been, been known. But of course, yeah, it could be something totally different in Canada. So we'll We'll hopefully yeah. eventually figure that out. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so have you been able to bind, see binding, physical binding? No, we haven't looked at physical binding. Um, you know, we've, we've done some in vivo modeling, um, uh, you, you doing like wound models, uh, but we haven't done, you know, we haven't done physical binding. Um, mm. And yeah, and I actually, we're actually working on in terms of in vivo stuff, and this is not related to your question, but, but um, we have two models, a planarian model, because planarians actually produce, um, they excrete mucus uh, on the outside of their body through these little worms, right? And then um, we also have this other model um, called Hydra, which is um, another mucus secreting um, little marine organism. And so, yeah, so, so we're kind of exploring some of these in vivo uh, models um, that are not mammalian models, but, but we, I think there might be really cool models for mucosal um, infections. So, Thank you. Um, back we'll over to, to Jay then. Yeah, uh, Patrick, so we have a question about um, the potential of using CAR T cells um, for Treg based therapy for ABPA. C could you, uh, you know, could you make it in vitro Treg that, and then essentially express the, the appropriate uh, TCR or a chimeric antigen receptor and would that potentially be therapeutic? Yeah, that's that's of course an interesting idea, right? Because what what our data suggests that that you have kind of this T reg shield, but it has some gaps, and so the gaps uh, are, are where the allergic response uh, comes from. So indeed, when we could equip the T regs with the T cell receptors from the Th two cells, uh, that might be of course great. The question is whether you could whether they help with an already established Th two response. This is something uh, that is not very well known because the T-Rex might be better to prevent uh, the Th2 uh, differentiation, but whether they could also suppress an already existing allergic reaction, uh, this is something uh, which is not known. I mean, there's some, some uh, conflicting data out in, in mouse models and, and we, we simply don't know uh, at the moment. But in principle, it, it would be, I think, the right strategy, right, to, to first define which T cell receptor are the protective and, and the pathogenic ones, and then try to modulate uh, the whole system. And then um, another TCR-related question was, uh, was cross-reactivity between aspergillus with uh, Canada auris or mucor. We haven't looked into Candida aureus so far. Um, we, we see some low cross-reactivity with, with mucor, but we see it typically more strongly between more, more related uh, fungi, which is also somehow clear, right? Because they, they have more similar uh, proteins. Um, I think it might be also a question of to what you are exposed to frequently. So I think this 
maybe chronic interaction with both candida and aspergillus might be also a driver of this uh, cross-reactive response because it can be triggered right from both uh, sides uh, all the time. And this could really lead to an outgrowth of, of such a, a cross-reactive T cell response that we don't have um, with, with the candida uh, aureus, for example. And, and have you had opportunity to look at uh, the age dependency of these responses? Like, you, can you detect these in adolescents or pediatric? It's a, it's a great question. We haven't done that, but we, we definitely want to do that. So we think that also like, I mean, if you're at a very old age, you, you had, have been exposed to these kind of antigens for a really long time, and that might be really a driver also of such a cross-reactive uh, T cell response that really expands then in, in the end uh, quite dramatically. Great, thanks. Professor Gao. Um, so, Clarissa, two questions from Katrina Marr. The uh, first is, um, you said that mucin proteins are really only 3% of the mucus layer, uh, but the mucin genes are upregulated in the context of infection. So the question is, how much does the actual concentration of muc mucins increase during infection from that 3% layer uh, value? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I don't think that we, we know the answer to this question. I mean, so few people study mucus in general, but, but when they do study mucus, they just study the whole thing. And they don't really, um, you know, study it in terms of its components. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, in terms of disease states, you know, so mucins are really the important component of mucus that provides that viscoelasticity to the mucosal layer. And so, um, in different disease states, that viscoelasticity does change. Um, and also um, like during pregnancy as well, for example, visco the viscoelastic um, nature of the mucosal layer changes. So I'm sure that there are um, changes in that proportion of mucins in the mucus. We just, we've just not measured them. Um, and so that would be really interesting to know if it, what those changes are during infection, for example. Um, Thanks. Yeah. And of course, the second part is actually the same question between Katrina and uh, Laura Roosh, which is, do mucin proteins affect the growth and viability of cells in a preformed biofilm? Or is it just yeah. the ability to form a biofilm? Right, yeah, so I didn't mention this at all. I wouldn't talk about, you know, that, but we have looked at, you know, adding mucins to um, mature biofilms. And so they, they do, it does not affect cell viability or growth at all, but it does actually break up the biofilm. And so it kind of basically um, maintains the cells in more of a planktonic state rather than in um, the full biofilm state. So, yeah, so it does have an effect on a mature biofilm. And like I mentioned, I think it kind of like keeps the candidalbican cells in check. So it can't overgrow and make this really thick biofilm that has the potential to penetrate the mucosal epithelial layer, but it keeps it kind of thin, right? Um, um, and um, and I actually, I, I see that there's also a question from Bernie about, you know, it kind of related, but if mucins inhibit hyphae, you know, why, why do we find hyphae in the gut, right? And so I think that kind of fits too, because, um, you know, like, like I mentioned, I think that the mucins are really just keeping the the candida in check and the biofilm in check and just not letting it overgrow. But in, in the actual gut, you know, there's still gonna be hyphae there. It's just, you're not able to make as thick of a biofilm as you would um, if the mucins were not there. Right? Uh, there's a suggestion from these observations, the actual, the dynamics of the wall must be changed by the presence of the oglycans because they're, you know, see if they're thinning out, it sounds as though that so uh, bonds which are holding it together are actually being cleaved. So that suggests an active process in um, regulating the 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 actual architecture of the biofilm by the oglycans, which is very intriguing. Yeah, I think that I think that's a very intriguing and a very um, real possibility. But yeah, we don't know yet. Hmm. Okay, back to Jay. Yes, uh, thanks, Neil. Um, Petra, so, um one thing we've observed, at least with tissue resident memory TH17 cells, that they appear to be, um, you know, less plastic, less plastic compared to in vitro TH17 cells. So if you take in vitro TH17 cells and treat them with IL-12, um, they convert to TH1 cells. And so have, have you looked at whether your cells have any uh, plasticity or that you mentioned that maybe that they're fixed over a period of time, but in terms of like, if they see other cytokine cues that, um, are they plastic? And if not, you know, uh, why? Like, uh, is that an epigenetic um, issue with those cells? Or Yeah, that's, that's also an interesting question. So, I mean, we, we, um, we 
uh, have a look for, for the Canada TH17 response in, in more detail. And we see, for example, in, in several um, other disease conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, and, and uh, that, that um, there's also an increased TH17 response. But we also see an increase of, of the TH1 compartment. But these seem to be really on separate cells. So we do not uh, observe that the TH17 cells start to upregulate like interferon gamma, but uh, this seems to be really rather uh, stable uh, in these cells. So I I don't know if one can really relate this, this in vitro findings of, of, of the plasticity then uh, directly to, to what we observe in vivo. I mean, there can be quite some specific conditions where the, where the cells are more plastic in the end. But at least for the candida reactive cells, we see rather that they are much more stable than we might have expected. And, and what about requirements for IL-2 per se? Because you know it's well known that Tregs really need a lot of IL-2 to survive and proliferate, whereas TH17 cells maybe- The candy directive that they make medical uh, of, of IL-2, so it's it's really strong. For the aspergillus, um, it's it's more difficult. So we do not see from the effector cells so much uh, uh, IL-2 production, uh, um, especially in the healthy donors. So we think that maybe also this, this few memory cells in the healthy donors that we find, they're not very, very good, so to say. So they have only low affinity for the antigen. Um, that they produce few cytokines, so we are not really sure if they're really generated against aspergillus or whether it's more like a general cross-reactivity that, that we observe there. But why aspergillus is unable to drive such a strong t reg response, this is really an open question. So I, I think it must be somehow related maybe to the lung environment and maybe also the, the, the quantity of the antigen that we, we are exposed to. So I mean, we we inhale probably several spores, but if you if you calculate that down really to the protein content, it's it's less than one microgram per year that that uh, you assume that you are really exposed to, um, and this is really minute amount of antigen, and that could really be also a driver of of such a regulatory T cell response uh, that these cells are preferentially activated over the uh, conventional cells. Well, and also I guess the the resting canidia are have hydrophobin, right? And, and then, so do you think that you need swelling or, or germination to get the T cell response in the lung? And that's an interesting question. So we, we have looked for that actually for the conventional cells that we tested all these different uh, development stages. And, and there we see more the reactivity against the, the, the growing fungus so, and, and the mycelia. We have a preliminary experiment where we also looked for, for um, the T-Rex, and there it seems to be that we get equal responses uh, against the resting conidia. So this could be really also an effector that they mainly recognize these resting conidia, and as soon as they start somehow to, to germinate, then just uh, the effector response uh, comes into play. Thank you. Dr. Um, so, Clarissa, uh... Claudia Duarte Oliveira asks a couple of questions, one of which you've asked, but she's uh, interested in the, the use of oglycans as a kind of reagent. And you might predict, as, as he's indicating this question, that you might get synergies with combinations of antifungals by making you know, the, it's less of a barrier. And, and the other part is that if you are envisaging this as a reagent that could be used to disperse and inhibit biofilms, what do you know about any potential unwanted effects on things like epithelial cells, immune cells, et cetera, um, of, by adding the oglycans? Yeah. So um, Rachel Heavy's group and actually Katarina Ribeck's group are, are looking into this because they're really interested in pursuing the therapeutic potential of, of these synthetic compounds, um, the synthetic oglycans specifically. You know, I wouldn't expect but that there are toxic effects but you know because they really are just like you know it looks like in terms of our natural glycans but um but it, it still does need to be tested right um and so they are doing those toxicity um assays um i do think it would be really interesting to do the the you know combinatorial um assays as well, which we have not done yet, but mixing the oglycans with, um, you know, common antifungal drugs and to see if that um, improves the biofilm disruption potential and, and things like that. I think that'd be really, um, really, really interesting to do. So it has not been done yet, but um, it's on our list. Thank you. Um, pass back to Jay. 
Great. Um, so, Peter, you, you, um, in terms of future directions, um, is your group, since now that we have good drugs to treat at least like about 90% of patients with cystic fibrosis that have a misfolded protein mutation, um, what the effect of potentially correcting the channel, the chloride channel uh, function, how that affects these responses? Or, or have you had an opportunity to enroll patients uh, after you know initiation of effector modulator therapy and see if that affects the T cell. Maybe maybe these you mentioned that T cells could be good biomarkers for diagnosing infection, but also I wonder if they're good biomarkers for assessing the the uh, successful uh, modulation of CFTR function in CF patients. Definitely, it's it's really a great question. So we uh, we are just starting to do that. Uh, as I said, we we are really fo following this cystic fibrosis cohort now for a long time, which is an advantage because we exactly know how the, how the people reacted before, and then we can see um, how how the response might change during the therapy. I think what is in general not very well understood is is if if this is really like a memory uh, that we build out against something like aspergillus and, 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 and also general commensals and, and chronically encountered antigens or whether you need really the presence uh, of the antigen uh, to, to, to maintain kind of this response. So I think this will be highly interesting to, to see if, if we find uh, changes in, in, in these patients or whether kind of this pathologic memory that once has been generated will stay independent of uh, whether they might have less infections uh, with aspergillus in the end. Yeah, I think that's a really exciting area. All right, uh, Dr. Gao. Okay, so, so Clarissa, um, you began to hint that some of the your studies were beginning to reveal essential genes or genes which are required for this interaction. Uh, in Canada. And there's a question about whether, for example, mating type and sex specific gene expression patterns were altered. You said that these are generated oval cells, but they were not opaque cells. So, what can you tell us about some of the sort of morphogenetic pathways that are, are, are potentially influenced by these old glycans and mucins? Yeah. Um... So a lot of the filamentation pathways are definitely, so NRG1 is one of the major players um, in response to mucin, and that's a transcription factor. Um, you know, and there's actually quite a few of the uh, biofilm regulators <clears throat> that overlap, like TEC1, for example, um, is also, also seems to be a major player in the, the interaction um, uh, with mucins as well. So, um, so yeah, so I think uh, so far, and I have to go and kind of, go through all of Ashley's data, but but I think Tech one and NRG1 are sort of major players, and those are both involved in um, filamentation pathways, right, uh, and also biofilm pathways. Um, now, the sex gene, so there doesn't seem to be, um, in, in terms of, you know, the mating type genes, those were not differentially expressed um, in the presence of um, mucins, and, and I'm wondering if the cells might, you know, the morphology is also similar to, like, Suzanne Noble's gut cells morphology, so, so they might be more like that, maybe gut cells, which also very, very closely resemble the opaque cell um, morphological state as well. So, so it could be that they are those gut cells, which would make sense in terms of um, being present in the, um, in, the, in, in the presence of the gastric mucins, right? Okay. So. so from what you're saying, it's possible that you have multiple mechanisms here, some which might be affecting directly the, the architecture of the surface of the candida cells and some which induce a range of different pathways which lead to suppression of hypo formation. So, it... yeah, and actually, I forgot to mention. Now that you brought that up, um, we did see quite a few genes differentially expressed that are involved in interspecies interactions with other um, microbes. So, um, I think that mucins also are likely affecting the ability of candida albicans to interact with, um, you know, other bacterial players, for example. Yeah. And um, and so, you know, it's possible that that mucins do this because they they may you know they are a nutrient source as well for for microbes that are in the microbiota so they might do that in in that way um or they might be some kind of a signaling molecule as well um but we do know for example that um the mucins um they so pseudomonas aeruginosa actually um you know 
typically is, has an antagonistic relationship with candida albicans, right? And, 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 and inhibits candida albicans viability and filmentation. Um, and it seems like um, mucins actually uh, mediate that interaction. We looked a little bit at this as well, um, where we've, if you put mucins there and you grow candida with pseudomonas together, um, they actually grow um, nicely together. And there's not that antagonistic interaction um, occurring. Um, and, and it's likely because mucins are kind of shifting candida into this more maybe commensal state, right? And Pseudomonas actually interacts in a friendly way with candida when it's in that state. And it's only when candida's making the more aggressive long hyphae that Pseudomonas is an antagonistic um, mm. interaction. So it's actually very interesting. I think it's gonna be really complex yeah. to explore. We're being guided by the host that this is probably us time to wrap up. I, I did want to kind of just comment that uh, as possibility to a very nice work by Dave Andy suggesting that extracellular vesicles might be transporting essential components for vesicle formation and these might be interfering with that process but I guess what we are doing is laying the grounds for our next micro talk in this area uh, it seems a, a, a lot to be said and, and I, I want to uh, uh, thank you Clarissa but we we'll also uh, want to thank Petra for two fabulous talks really wonderful and very clearly explained with beautiful slides to illustrate the, the information. And thank you everybody for, for coming along to this session and looking forward to seeing you all uh, at the next session, which I think is on the 29th, as you said, and please, please register early for that. Final word to you, Jay. Yeah, I mean, thanks. It was a great session and, and uh, th thanks for um, all the participants that, that, that stayed on and uh, Thanks, uh, Dr. Blocker and uh, Dr. Nobile for great talks and see you in September.